The next few sections of this chapter of the 301 workbook consider just some of the other um, properties of voltages and current sources as well as conductors and then we'll head into um, more details on resistors and then um, do a little bit of circuit analysis uh, using all the laws and properties that we've covered up to that point. But before that, let's look at conductors. One thing that's important to remember, of course, conductors represent uh, unbroken lines between the ends of circuit elements, and that the voltage between the ends of an ideal conductor, hence very important um, adjective there, ideal conductor, is always zero, right? Um, that has a lot to do with the material properties of the of the conductor and that it's pure and that you ideally would have no voltage there's no uh, occurring across it um, and that's regardless of the current right when two nodes uh, two points in a circuit are connected by an ideal conductor we say the points are shorted together so another name for a short circuit sometimes is called an ideal conductor so what's important to remember is that for a short circuit, um, you have uh, no voltage. You have current flowing between the nodes, but there is no voltage. Um, all points in a circuit connected by ideal conductors can be considered a single node. We've seen that before uh, in previous examples where there are no circuit elements in between the two terminals. There's just connectors or conductors between them. That is all considered to be a single node. However, if no conductors or other circuit elements are connected between two parts of the circuit, you may have what we call an open circuit, right? It's completely open. Um, in that particular situation, um, no current can flow through that. So again, what we're looking at uh, in the case of an open circuit would be just a complete break such as this, where there is no current flowing between these two terminals there, right? Um, and uh, there's voltage that could be uh, generated from other parts of the circuit, um, but there is no current in that, in that open circuit. Um, versus again, if we connect it together and have a short circuit, then you, you may have current flowing, but you have no voltage, right? So let's talk about voltage sources. They'll come in two flavors for our circuits. You may have what's called an independent voltage source, and the adjective is pretty indicative of what the situation is, is that the voltage is independent of anything else in the circuit. Um, and typically what you're going to use is a circle. We've seen this earlier on. Both, most voltage sor uh, sources are indicated by a circle, and you indicate the polarities of which, um, which polar terminal is positive or negative by putting a plus minus. If I put the plus here at the top, it means it's nearest node here. Uh, its nearest terminal, that's the positive terminal, and this is the negative terminal. And then this is a constant one. This is what we refer to as a DC voltage source. Um, and this would be, for example, like a battery, and that's certainly independent, all right? Uh, similarly, you could have an AC voltage source over here where you have the voltage changing with time, all right? So you have a cosine function that's indicating it, which means that um, the sign changes. In other words, the uh, the the voltage may flip from positive to negative according to this function, all right? But we'll go ahead for reference purposes, indicate this is the positive reference pole and that's the negative one, all right? But again, these um, represent two situations where the voltage is going to be generated independently that does not depend on any other circuit element or any other aspect of the circuit. The voltage is generated by, on its own, either with this kind of a function or as a constant value. Now, if we turn over to page 16, okay, it's important to realize that, again, both of those sources are independent because they're independent of other voltages and currents in the circuit. Um, sometimes reality and the notion of an ideal circuit are actually in conflict. Um, here's a situation that is kind of a paradox, all right, that we just want to make clear up some confusion that uh, sometimes comes up. Um, and you'll notice below that this is a closed circuit, right? And so we've indicated that we have an independent voltage source here of 12 volts, 
positive negative polarity here. And we've indicated um, the fact that we're representing a voltage between these two nodes as Vx, positive and negative polarities are there. Um, but uh, by the definition of voltage source, we should have that Vx should be 12 volts. But for an ideal conductor between these two nodes, there is uh, nothing else, right? The ideal conductor requires that Vx to be zero, all right? So in other words, it's not much of a circuit anyway if we're going to take a battery and hook up the terminals of the battery to each other, right? So if anything else that could possibly happen here is it could create damage. Um, uh, it's very possible the wire could possibly melt by doing that, all right? So this is an example of short circuiting a battery, a short circuiting a voltage source is generally never a good idea to do, all right? So even though we can write this down theoretically, uh, it makes little sense to do that in reality. So we typically avoid these kinds of situations, right? Now let's move on to dependent voltage sources. All right, now this is different in the sense that we're using voltage or current generated uh, or produced elsewhere in the circuit uh, and sort of amplifying it or modifying it and, and generating more voltage or current accordingly. So a dependent or controlled voltage source, right, you typically indicate by a diamond. You change the circle to a diamond, again, indicating the polarities according to which terminal is positive, which terminal is negative, right? And then to the side, you're indicating what the control is. In other words, who is, what other component, uh, what other property are you using in the circuit to determine what this voltage is? So for this particular dependency, what it's saying is that we're going to generate twice the voltage that is produced in this circuit element here, all right? And similarly, in this example, this is a, another voltage, um, uh, uh, this is a dependent voltage source controlled by uh, a current value, all right? Which in this case is the current flowing through this circuit element. So what we have here are the cases of voltage being dependent upon either another voltage or another current, depending upon, again, how this is set up. So one way to think about this is uh, just a little notation here. This is an example of voltage controlled dependent voltage source. And over here is an example of uh, current controlled voltage source, okay. Um, so either way, it just, it just depends on how you set it up, all right? So either your the, the control is by voltage or if the control is by a current, all right? Um, or sometimes people might write, some, sometimes you'll see this, or maybe it's possible they may write CC, just means current controlled, voltage controlled, okay? So I'm happy with either way, but uh, uh, and, and maybe it might be easier just to, you know, VCCC, so we don't get too many things confused here. But this is a voltage controlled dependent voltage source. This is a current controlled um, voltage source, okay? The factor multiplying the current and the current controlled voltage source is called the gain. It's a gain factor, right? So, um, again, this is the situation here. This is current controlled voltage source, and that factor three we would call the gain factor. Its units are volts per amperes or ohms, right? And the controlled voltage sources are useful, certainly. Um, for modeling different kinds of amplifiers, transistors, and electrical generators, right? Um, so sometimes if you hear the term, the gain that's being applied, this is the situation you're looking at. What's the multiplying factor? It's three times this current is being used to amplify up that voltage, okay? Um, and let's look at independent current sources. So again, just like with voltage sources, we can look at current being independent. Um, so current sources could take on two different forms. Um, uh, you could see this representation down here from a uh, independent current source is DC. 
and the winner here on the right is from an AC circuit. So in this case, this is just constant two amps currents uh, generated by this current source. Uh, and this is, a, this is an alternating current, obviously, because it can alternate in sign and magnitude, right? Generated by a sign uh, curve, right? But the word independent applies because, again, they do not require any knowledge of any voltages or currents anywhere else in the circuit, which is very unlike these situations. That's why they're dependent. There's no dependency here, right? It's either I'll generate it according to a sine curve or it's perhaps constant. Uh, the convention used uh, typically in textbooks for the voltage polarity is indicated below, all right? So we need to sort of Keep in mind there's voltages are even with these current sources. So uh, at the top of page 17, you'll see the convention is this. So that if you have this DC uh, circuit and you've got, a con you've got a constant current source of two amps, let's just let the arrow point to the positive uh, voltage and the um, tail is at the negative, okay? So again, if for example, in the circuit you had the current source generating the current flow this direction then our default will be that from a voltage standpoint in this source because again it has voltage as well this will be the positive pole and that'll be the negative okay that'll be convinced that'll be our convention let that arrow be pointing to the plus kind of similar to prc um Similar to voltage sources, it's sometimes necessary to have current controlled by another current of voltage. So again, here we go again with a dependent source. But the only difference this time is, again, dependent, think diamond. So always be thinking of diamond or dependent, okay? Okay. So you'll always be drawing a diamond, but rather than putting a plus minus to indicate polarities for the voltage, we're generating current. In this case, what's important is the direction of the current flow. And again, indicating here in terms of, you know, how you're mag magnifying uh, according to what voltage or current you're using, right? So this is, a, again, an exa example of voltage controlled current source because you're using the voltage out of this circuit element. And over here again is another example of current controlled, okay? DC and CC, just like we have with voltages. This is current controlled, this is voltage controlled, right? Um, if, for example, this voltage VX turned out to be five volts, then we know that the current through the controlled current source is three times that, which is 15 amps. Okay. All right. So the question then is, all right, notice that we're using a voltage and we're generating amps. So the question is, is what units does that gain parameter really have? So this is a gain parameter here of three. So voltage is coming in, or, or at least a voltage value is coming in, but we're generating amperes, right, um, for the current source. So clearly what we need here is the units has to be amperes per volts, correct? because we're taking five volts and we're multiplying it times three somethings. So we're multiplying it by three amper per volts to get 15 amps, right? And this measure of amps per volts actually has a name. That's a semen or Siemens in plural there, okay? And sometimes you'll see the notion of Siemens as inverse omega like that, okay? So it's very similar to an ohm. It's actually the inverse of an ohm, all right? Which uh, we've talked about, we're getting ready to talk about resistors, of course, and we've looked at Ohm's law. So a Siemens just, is just the, is the inverse. Um, now what's interesting is if you look over on this circuit, all right, and you have a current controlled um, dependent current source, you may ask, well, what, what unit or do you use on this gain parameter? Think about that, for example. So this was using five volts, all right, as a representation with a gain parameter to reduce amperes. So the conversion factor in the gain has to be in Siemens, but you're taking values here that are amps, 
and you're just boosting up amps. So there are no units on this gain parameter. Okay. In fact, if we go back just for a second, if we go back over to the dependent voltage source, the same thing happens here. This was the voltage control dependent voltage source. Notice that this is volts generating volts. So this gain parameter two has no units. Whereas over here, right, you're taking uh, the dependency is based on current and you're generating volts, right? So that's why you have to take so many amps multiplied by volt amps or ohms, right, to get volts back. So the gain parameters have real units when you're using sort of a mixed mode of current to generate voltage, or in the case of what we're doing on page 17, um, you are using, um, you're using volts to generate current there, okay? In Siemens is a ratio of ampere per volt. Sometimes people may use the word inverse ohm. And dependent current sources are also used in amplifiers, transistors, transformers, and other electrical devices. So now what we're going to do is we've covered most of the basics. We're just gonna dive a little bit deeper now into probably one of the most fundamental circuit elements that makes uh, a very strong, important use of energy, especially in heating in an amplification and so forth sound. So the voltage across an ideal resistor, right? We've, we've drawn resistors before from our basic intro. The voltage across that resistor is proportional to the current through the resistor, right? So that constant of proportionality is called the resistance. So the resistance is this, is a constant of proportionality, all right? And we know Ohm's law states that the voltage must be related to the current by this proportion, and therefore the law states and V has to be IR, where I is the current. And the passive reference configuration for the resistance is given here, okay? You have a resistance R, and the current is flowing into the positive voltage polarity, right? So this is definitely PRC for a resistance, such that we know that the energy is being absorbed right? Energy is not being delivered, right? Power will be always positive for resistances, okay? Right? So the units of resistance are ohms, right? Again, uh, capital letter omega is typically used. Typical ranges of values, which are always positive, okay? That's important to remember. You're always going there. If, if, if we see negative ohms, that will have no meaning, okay? Um, so milliohms um, to mega ohms are very reasonable ranges in terms of the scale factors that you could look at in those circuits. Um, current reference direction enters, if, it, if the reference direction enters the negative voltage, then we know what to do. We've seen this before. This is not PRC. If it's not passive reference and the current is entering the negative pole, then Ohm's law takes a slight change that the voltage has to be minus I times R, okay? And again, we can also use subscripting as we've talked about before. You could use subscripting to indicate the reference directions for your current and your voltage, right? Okay. Um, again, in this case, uh, you could write VAB equals IAB if we know the current direction enters through A and leaves through B, okay? The first subscript is associated with the positive polarity of the voltage, right? So notice that you could take uh, Ohm's law, simply stated as B equals IR, and solve it for the current and obtain this formula that tells you that you always get your current by one over the resistance times the voltage, right? Now well, let's turn over to page 18. <clears throat> that particular fraction, right, one over R is, has a name, sometimes people will refer to that as the conductance. So one over the resistance is really what's known as the conductance. And sometimes you may see that represented by the capital letter G. So one over capital R uh, would represent G in terms of conductance. And the formula then would become I equals G times V. And the unit of conductance are Siemens again. In other words, obviously one over an ohm, right? Which are Siemens. <clears throat> 
Now, we'll finish out this brief introduction to resistors with talking a little about design issues, all right, before we get into power calculations with them. Um, so you can construct ideal resistors by attaching terminals to conductive materials. So it's very important to have conductive materials for resistance. At the microscopic level, uh, what's happening is that the electrons and the metals are moving through the conductive material, creating a current, right? So the movement of electrons through the conductive material generates the current. And if you apply voltage to the materials, an electronic field is created, and that really causes the electrons to accelerate, right? So applying the voltage right, to the materials causes the electrons to get excited and they start accelerating. And that accelerating causes the electrons to start colliding with the atoms of that material that you've used for conduction. And when they start colliding, they lose momentum. However, they will continue to accelerate after the collisions and overall achieve about a constant average velocity. So we'd be imagining sort of like um, you know, you, you could imagine, um, you know, you, collisions happening very chaotic randomly, but then overall, after a while, just about all the electrons are traveling about the same speed, okay? Hence, at the macroscopic level, the current appears, because of that effect, the, at the macroscopic level, standing back a little bit, the current appears to be proportional to the applied voltage, right? And that's what Ohm law. Ohm's law is representing that proportionality between the current flow and this average velocity that the, uh, the um, electrons are achieving. The dimensions and the geometry of a resistor definitely will de uh, uh, define that proportionality, okay, again, um, between the current and the uh, voltage. Um, typically, they appear as long bars or cylinders, all right. And what we're gonna do is draw a cross section of a physical resistor and illustrate how resistance can be defined by a simple formula. So again, here's just sort of an illustration of resistance in terms of a long cylinder, sort of in a pseudo 3D design. And we'll put a terminal out here, connector here, connector there, and look at a cross section. Okay, so again, we're taking a cross section. We'll say cross sectional area, okay? And we'll define that area A. So we take a cross section. Of course, that'll change depending on how thin it is or how fat it is, right? Um, and uh, we'll select the length of that tube or cylinder. We'll let that be L, okay? So from a physical standpoint, you can show that this, the resistance proportionality constant between the current and the voltage when, you're, when your circuit element looks like this can be determined by this formula. R is Greek letter rho times L divided by that cross-sectional area, okay? So A is the cross-sectional area. So that's, you know, so what's gonna happen is you can see that as the area increases, the resistance gets smaller if this was fatter. If the area drops, uh, you, you make this a much smaller tube, whatever, then this resistance could grow a little bit. But also another important factor is the length. So you can adjust resistance by how long it is as well. Um, but the material property you choose has an effect too, and that's, the importance of that factor, a row, which is called the resistivity. And this is a material property. You may be, uh, some of you may be material science majors, so we can't get away from material properties here of the conductive material. And so that has an effect on how much resistance you're generating as well, right? Um, and so the units are ohm meters for the resistivity, okay? So this, this, this uh, resistivity has um, measured by what are called ohm meters, right? And you can see why, because you're gonna have ohm meters multiplied by meters, and then the area will be meter squared. Remember, this resistance R needs to come out as ohms, right? So that's why that resistivity uh, unit has to be ohm meters. So just to give you an illustration of properties here, conductors, um, that are typically used 
uh, generally generate low resistance, but their conductance value is very high. They're very high conductors, okay, in terms of allowing um, current flows. Insulators are just the reverse, very high resistivity, but very low conductance, okay? So it's kind of like two different extremes in terms of choosing materials for this, this property R. But typically, what people tend to use in most circuit designs are semiconductors. And that's simply because of this very nice property that they're kind of halfway between being very good generating, so the generating, generating very good resistance and being really fairly good conductors as well. So this is sort of the ideal situation for more circuit designs is you don't need the extremes of generating very low resistance. You want some more flexibility. And so semiconductors tend to do that very nicely for you. So finally, let's do an example here. Suppose you had were, wanted to compute the resistance of a copper wire, and you physically knew that the diameter of the wire was 2.05 millimeters and the length of it was 10 meters. You would have to look up in a chart, uh, or you'd, you'd have your um, uh, online references for resistivity values. So for copper, it turns out in ohm meters, uh, the value is this. Notice very small, relatively very small values here. And so if you wanted the resistance using our formula up here, you would need to compute the area. Now, since you're given the diameter, you might change your typical area formula here and write it as this, pi diameter squared divided by four. Why we do that? Well, because the diameter is twice the radius. And it's typical many times that you'll see measurements of wire in diameters rather than radii, okay? So if, it's just making sure we adjust accordingly to our area calculation. And so in this case, it'd be pi times the uh, 2.05 times 10 to the minus three meters. If we're staying in meters, remember, you need to make the adjustment. Be careful, that's millimeters. So you need to make sure you convert it to meters, right? So we'll do that. And then that quantity has to be um, squared and you need to divide by four. And if you do that, I'll save the time here, you would get about 3.3 um, times 10 to the minus six, um, in this case, meters squared, okay? Because this has been converted to meters, so let's just put that there. And that makes sense because if you multiply those exponents, you can see that. Um, and then finally, to compute the resistance for this copper wire, then you would take the resistivity value, the material property, you've got the cross-sectional area, and you multiply it by the length. So in this case, we'll have the resistivity uh, 1.72 times 10 to the minus 8 for copper. Mean multiply by the length. The length is in meters, so there's no unit change. Again, just be very careful. We're all looking at meters here. This is in this this is in ohm meters. If someone's going to give you a length, you'd like to make sure you could get it converted quickly to meters. And then you'll divide this by the cross-sectional area here. Again, this would be uh, we're looking at ohms meters here, um, times meters in terms of units and we are dividing by 3.3 times 10 to the minus six meters squared. And again, this unit was ohm meters, 10 was meters, all the units cancel out here, and you would get 0 0.52 ohms. Very low, very low resistance, okay? In the sense that by Ohm's law, voltage is related the current times the resistance. So whatever current you're going to have flowing through, the voltage is going to be uh, a very small, small component of that. Okay. Okay. All right. So there we have just simple basic design issues with resistance. We're going to start with some calculations of power and then be able to get into looking at different circuit designs with resistance and be able to compute voltages and currents anywhere we need to in the circuit.